Freeman on patient safety within the NHS in Scotland. The Cabinet Secretary will take questions at the end of her statement, so I would encourage all members who wish to ask a question to press their request to speak buttons as soon as possible. And I call on the Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Presiding Officer. The recent loss of life where a healthcare associated infection was a contributory factor is a stark reminder of how vital infection prevention and control measures are. I'm sure I speak for the whole chamber when I offer my sincere sym sympathies and condolences to the family and friends who have lost loved ones. I know from speaking with NHS staff that they too are profoundly affected by the loss of their patients. Every day our frontline NHS staff work as much as is possible to prevent and control healthcare associated infections. And they have my thanks and I'm sure the thanks of this chamber for the vital role they play and the responsibility they take. The step change in the approach to managing infections in Scotland stems from the C. difficile outbreak in 2007-08 at the Vale of Leven Hospital. At that time, C. diff and MRSA were the biggest infection threats to patients. But identification of the outbreak did not happen quickly enough to stop the spread of infection, and many of the cases were only identified as being part of a major outbreak through retrospective analysis. The subsequent inquiry and efforts of the Scottish Government and the NHS led to the introduction of a national inspection and scrutiny programme of healthcare facilities and developed a national infection prevention and control manual with clear and wide-ranging procedures for healthcare professionals to follow. It also set up the world-leading Scottish Patient Safety Programme, which has contributed to significant and sustained improvement in a range of areas, including healthcare-associated infection. These approaches have delivered real results. In people who are most at risk, those over age 65, C. diff infections reduced by 85% from 6,325 cases in 2008 to 917 cases in 2017. So whilst infection incidents on the scale of the Vale of Leven are now markedly rarer, it remains vitally important that we continue to learn from them and take whatever further steps are necessary to make sure our NHS is as safe as it possibly can be. Last year, there was a water contamination incident within the Royal Hospital for Children in Glasgow. The previous Cabinet Secretary asked Health Protection Scotland to examine those issues, and I published the report from HPS on Friday. The HPS report makes a number of recommendations, and members have my commitment today that they will be addressed. The report will also be passed to the Independent Review Group to consider as part of its work to review the design, commissioning, construction, handover and maintenance of the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital and how these matters contribute to effective prevention, infection prevention and control. My officials are in the concluding stage of appointing two co-chairs of this review. The potential co-chairs have asked for time to consider what would be required of them in order to ensure that they could fulfil their responsibilities. I fully appreciate that members will be keen to see this work begin as a matter of urgency. I am too. But I am also adamant that we take the time we need to appoint the right clinical experts to re lead this critically important work. The focus is on the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, but the lessons are for NHS Scotland. We need to ensure that our physical infrastructure is designed, built and maintained to maximise infection prevention and control. I expect to be able to advise Parliament shortly on the review chairs and then the remit and membership, all in line with the recommendations of Professor Britton. Since the water contamination incident, NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde has also notified a number of other infection outbreaks. These notifications happen as a result of the clear procedures agreed after the Vale of Leven tragedy and set out in the National Infection Control and Prevention Manual, evidence of a monitoring and control system that acts much earlier to identify and control infection and protect patient safety. Some infections, such as Staphylococcus aureus bloodstream infections at the Princess Royal Maternity Unit, are common in the general population, but can impact acutely on patients who are very unwell, 
and likely to have a lower immunity. Other infections like Stenotrophomonas multifilia at the Royal Alexandra Hospital are rare. But no matter whether the infection is rare or not, it is crucial that staff identify it early, deal with it and prevent it spreading. In all infection outbreaks, immediate additional measures are put in place to ensure that hygiene and infection prevention is absolutely as good as we need it to be. Given the serious nature of these incidents, my officials have daily phone calls with Health Protection Scotland so that I can be updated, and the Healthcare Incident Infection Assessment Tool, HIAT, those reports are delivered following multidisciplinary disciplinary incident management team updates. Following the cryptococcus infection at Queen Elizabeth University Hospital, as members know, I, I asked healthcare, healthcare Environment Inspectorate to undertake an unannounced inspection of the Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. The report of this inspection will be published by his on the 8th of March. We will publish our response to it at that time and it too will feed into the work of the expert review. Presiding officer, all these steps are important and it matters that whilst the independent review undertakes its work, we make any immediate improvements necessary and identified by these reports. I want to make sure the clinical voice is heard with regard to their work environment so they can continue to deliver safe, effective and person-centred care to their patients. The Health and Care Staffing Scotland Bill, which will come to stage three in this chamber in the coming months, follows Lord, M Lord Maclean's recommendation from the Vale of Leaven inquiry that we should act to ensure that the staffing and skill mix is appropriate for each ward and where this is not the case, an escalation process is in place to respond. The bill provides an opportunity to enable a rigorous evidence-based approach to decision-making on staffing, taking account of service users' health needs, including in infection prevention and control. And it is important too that we recognise the role and voice of all our frontline staff in NHS Scotland. Porters, domestic and housekeeping staff, catering, reception, maintenance, all have a critical role to play in effective patient safety. And I will be giving further thought to how we can ensure that across all our health boards, those voices and expertise are integral to the work on infection prevention and control. Scotland's response to healthcare associated infections is wide ranging and a number of expert agencies are involved. Health Protection Scotland is responsible for undertaking surveillance and horizon scanning for emerging threats and seeking advice from UK and international organisations where required. When, HIP, when HPS are made aware of threats, they produce guidance for NHS Scotland to prevent ongoing transmission of infections. Healthcare Environment Inspectorate leads on independent inspections of every NHS acute and community hospital in Scotland and since 2009, HEI has published 261 hospital inspections, as well as thematic inspections of theatres and invasive devices. The Scottish Government has underpinned these efforts by launching the mandatory National Infection Prevention and Control Manual in 2012, using a Once for Scotland approach and providing a framework for staff to apply effective prevention, infection prevention and control practice and it sets out the process which health boards must follow to manage incidents and outbreaks. We have led the world with the National Infection Prevention and Control approach. It has been adopted by NHS Wales and there are calls for it to be adopted across Scotland. So in conclusion, presiding officer, Scotland has made significant progress in the last decade on infection prevention and control. Spurred by the tragedy of the loss of 34 lives in the Vale of Leven, where C. diff was a contributory factor, NHS Scotland is now in a position to identify incidents and outbreaks much earlier and take immediate action. Infections are present in everyday life. We cannot avoid all infections, but we must ensure our systems include horizon scanning for emerging infection threats and ensuring preparedness and resilience. And I want to assure Parliament and through members of the public that a culture of improvement and safety is woven through our National Health Service and that I am committed 
to ensuring our hospitals remain some of the safest healthcare facilities in the world. Thank you. We move to questions now. Miles Briggs, to be followed by Monica Lennon. Miles thank you, President Officer. Can I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of her statement and also give our uh, thoughts to the families on these benches. Public confidence has been shaken in light of recent events in Glasgow. And what is now critical is that we see leadership and action to make sure our hospital estate is safe and all measures are put in place to meet the best standards of infection control. And I agree that clearly going forward, the review will suggest lessons and recommendations for other hospitals, including the new Edinburgh Sick Kids here in Edinburgh, around infection control measures and building standards above and beyond those currently in place. So can I ask the Cabinet Secretary, how will ministers make sure that any and all recommendations are taken forward by health boards? And will the Cabinet Secretary commit to the publication of any interim findings and recommendations as well? Cabinet Secretary. Um, uh, thank you uh, to Mr Briggs um, for his question. And I understand that uh, public confidence has been shaken, uh, which is in part why I made the statement that I made, just to remind us all of the significant improvements that have been made in terms of infection prevention and control across Scotland and the uh, steps that already exist so that we don't repeat uh, what happened at the Vale, where we don't see an outbreak until uh, it has progressed quite considerably. Um, that said, uh, I am not by any stretch of the imagination suggesting that everything therefore is fine. Where we have infection outbreaks, that suggests to me that there is more that we need to do. So I completely commit that uh, we will, if there are interim recommendations, we will make those public, uh, as well as our response that uh, we will make public, uh, not only publish the HEI report, but also uh, my response to that and the actions I will take uh, on that particular uh, cryptococcus matter and what HEI uh, tell us from that inspectorate report. Uh, and that uh, the overarching review, which um, until we appoint the co-chairs, I, I cannot say because it will be for them to determine how long they might think that will be, but I will hope that they will uh, agree a remit and a time frame and an approach which we can publish. And within that, we can see where there might be milestones, where there will be recommendations coming forward that we can act on. Uh, and I will certainly share that with the Health and Sport Committee, but I'm happy to share it more widely with members when we get to that point. Um, I hope that is helpful. Monica Lennon to be followed by Alison Johnson. Thank you, Presiding Officer, and I thank the Cabinet Secretary for advance sight of her statement. The thoughts of Scottish Labour remain with the families of those patients who have died. What has occurred is no reflection on the hardworking staff working in the hospitals affected by these infections. But it is clear that NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde has suffered reputational damage. A culture of secrecy has clouded the Health Board's communication, and I think we all agree that it has had an impact on public confidence. Staff and patients who did raise concerns about cleanliness, infection control, building maintenance, workforce pressures and more have felt their concerns weren't acted on and that is bitterly disappointing. In the interest of transparency, can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to update Parliament on how many patients have been affected by the infections referred to in her statement or any other rare infections, including how many patients have died, how many have received treatment and how many cases relating to hospital associated infections have been referred to the Procurator Fiscal in the last 12 months? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, I'm grateful to Ms Lennon for that question. In terms of the detail that she's asking for, in order to be absolutely certain that I provide the accurate detail, uh, if the member is content and other members, then I will uh, write to you later on today with all the, uh, the answer to all of those specifics, including the PF question, uh, as far as we know that, and make sure that that is shared with the other uh, party spokespersons on health so that they too have that information. Um, Ms Lennon knows uh, that I have, uh, in the previous statements in this parliament, recognised that uh, our health board communications across NHS Scotland um, are uh, at times not as good as I would want them to be. Um, I personally take the view that if you have information, you should give it to people, that there is nothing worse than a vacuum in which people uh, fill with their understandable worries and anxieties. Uh, and that's not an approach uh, that I want to see our health boards uh, uh, adopting. 
So we are working with them uh, to ensure that communications uh, are as transparent and detailed as it is possible for them to make, bearing in mind that they have an absolute duty uh, in terms of the Caldicott Guardian and other responsibilities to, to, uh, not to release any information that could lead to an individual patient being identified. Uh, so that curtails them to some extent, uh, but perhaps not always uh, across our boards to the extent to which they believe themselves to be curtailed. I am also aware uh, of concerns raised in the past in Greater Glasgow and Clyde. Some of those now uh, are, is information that I have, uh, and I will ensure that that information is passed to that independent review. Uh, I know that the individuals uh, raising that information or raising those matters with me will make sure of that too, but that information uh, in my hands, I have given them the commitment that I will make sure it is passed on and so that that review has the benefit of historic information as well as current uh, information and evidence it may choose to take. Alison Johnston to be followed by Alex Cole-Hamilton. Thank you. Um, the Cabinet Secretary recognises in her statement that all NHS staff, from clinicians to those involved in catering and maintenance, have a critical role to play in effective patient safety. Um, and I appreciate uh, the Cabinet Secretary has said that she will give thought to how we can make sure all those voices are heard. But given the pressure on staff who work in the NHS, what assurances can the Cabinet Secretary provide that staff will be given sufficient time for the expert training they need, for the mentoring they need, so that we can ensure patient safety? Cabinet Secretary. So, I mean, part of that does come through uh, the uh, staffing bill that is currently uh, working its way through this parliament, and that's why we are so keen to ensure that that legislation uh, is also applicable um, in our social care settings, where, of course, uh, safety, uh, infection control and, and prevention and uh, safety is uh, as important as it is in our acute settings. Um, and part of what I'm thinking about is making sure that in the, uh, in the standard uh, uh, committees and uh, work that a board should undertake as part of all those processes I outlined on what needs to be done in terms of infection prevention and control, that we are assured that uh, maintenance and housekeeping and uh, catering and those other uh, important uh, voices, if you like, are integral in the overall approach a board takes in a hospital setting and elsewhere to infection prevention and control and not seen as additional, but as central as uh, the involvement of nursing and uh, medical staff. So that is simply about making sure that the individuals who would then be part of those discussions do have that time to add uh, their particular expertise from the role that they play. Where there is additional training or support that is needed, uh, then I will expect boards to make that available. And as Ms Johnson knows, I meet regularly with the chairs of our health boards to seek their assurance on those areas that I consider uh, of utmost importance and patient safety. There can be nothing higher than that. Uh, in addition, the Chief Executive of NHS Scotland meets regularly with Chief Executives and all of those uh, discussions are aligned to the key priorities that the Government has. So we have that regular opportunity to get that assurance and also to act where we believe that what we need to be done is not being done. Alex Cole Hamilton to be followed by Emma Harper. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The investigation into the water contamination incident at the Royal Hospital for Sick Kids in Glasgow was instructed by the Cabinet Secretary's uh, predecessor on the 20th of March last year in answer to a question by Anna Sawar. Um, that report was concluded in December and uh, was given to the government, but the government only released that report this weekend. What was the reason for the delay? Why did that investigation take so long? And why did the government choose to not to release that information to Parliament and the general public until two months after they received it. Surely, if there are learning points for all of us, if we are all to work to combat infection control, then time is of the essence. Cabinet Secretary. Um, thank you. I'm grateful to Mr Cole Hamilton. Um, as, as I'm sure he will understand, uh, having read the report, um, identifying exactly what was the, core, the source uh, of the water contamination issue and taking the, the necessary steps to try and address that is a, 
as an uh, ever-changing situation uh, inside uh, that hospital uh, is a large part of why uh, it took uh, the time it did for uh, the work to be undertaken by HPS in order that they could produce conclusions and recommendations that they were confident of and that they also were assured they had looked uh, more widely for expert advice and support uh, to allow them uh, to get to that point. In terms of uh, why uh, we received the report, I was made aware of the report on the 21st of December uh, and why it was uh, then published uh, last week. Uh, I took the view, two, two parts to my view. I took the view that publishing it in the week before uh, Christmas uh, was not necessarily the most helpful thing to do uh, and would be considered uh, uh, in a critical light. Uh, but also I then took the view that I had to be sure to uh, how it would fit and the HPS could see it fit into the work of the wider independent review. There was no intention to not publish. It was about making sure that we could align it with the independent review. I had hoped, I'm sure members understand this, I had hoped to be able today to say who was going to lead the independent expert review into uh, Queen Elizabeth University Hospital. For the reasons I've outlined, outlined uh, I'm not able to do that. Um, all of that was uh, in part why uh, we took uh, longer than we would otherwise have wanted to do before we published the report itself. But there was absolutely no intention as evidenced by the fact that we have published the report and that I have given a commitment to implement the recommendations of that report, notwithstanding the independent review, to conceal anything. It is important that this information is available, understood and then acted on. Thank you. I'm conscious that the Minister is giving detailed answers, which I'm welcome. I welcome, but there are 10 more questioners to get through. Emma Harper to be followed by Brian Whittle. Emma Harper. Thank you, President Officer. Could the Cabinet Secretary confirm how the Scottish Government's approach to safe staffing will help ensure patient safety, as well as the delivery of high quality and safe care across our hospitals and emergency services? Cabinet Secretary. So the um, legislation on safe staffing um, is designed to ensure that there is a consistent approach across Scotland to understand uh, the workload uh, demands of any particular patient co cohort at any particular time in terms of their healthcare needs, the workload demands, and then the uh, skill mix that is required to address those demands. And inside that is, of course, uh, infection prevention and control, which, uh, as Ms Harper will know from her own experience, varies between different patient cohorts depending on what their presenting healthcare need is. So this is a piece of legislation, notwithstanding that uh, other colleagues will have ways by which they think it could be improved. I think we are all in agreement that it will provide that consistency uh, of uh, assuring and a methodology to ensure that workload is, is understood in the context of presenting healthcare needs by patients. The skill mix is then understood. We have the right staff in the right place and we have a way of escalating if uh, staff feel that they require additional support and that that is not being delivered to them. Brian Whittle to be followed by Sandra White. Hey, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, Health Improvement Scotland have no regulatory powers to enforce the implementation of recommendations. So for the confidence of staff and patients and given the seriousness of the situation, will the Cabinet Secretary commit the Scottish Government to implementing all of the HIS recommendations when they publish the Health Environment Inspectorate report? Cabinet Secretary. Uh, yes, I will. I also believe that the question of regulatory powers and the various bodies involved, Health Facility Scotland, Health Protection Scotland, Health Environment Inspectorate, will be part of that review. Because uh, as I said, the focus is on Queen Elizabeth, but the lessons are for NHS Scotland about what more might we do in order to ensure a more joined up approach uh, to what needs to happen and where regulatory powers it will be for the review to determine if they think that is needed, then I'm sure they'll produce those recommendations too. Sandra White, to be followed by David Stewart. Thank, thank you very much, President Officer. Uh, the Cabinet Secretary mentioned in her statement the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, which is helping to significantly reduce hospital mortality and I believe reducing avoidable harm at every stage of the care. Can the Cabinet Secretary provide an update on the hospital standardised mortality ratio figures or ratio figures for Scotland? Cabinet Secretary. 
Uh, yes, I can. Um, so the hospital standardised mortality ratio uh, has shown uh, a significant uh, decline. It has decreased by 13.2 per cent in uh, the, five, the period for four year period, January to March 2014 to July uh, to September 2018. Uh, that is all, of course, the Scottish Patient Safety Programme helps, uh, is one of the key uh, drivers of that reduction, uh, and we need to continue to see that uh, improvement, which been, has been a steady decline uh, since the introduction of, of some of the measures that I've outlined earlier. David Stewart, to be followed by Rona Mackay. <coughs> Uh, thank you, President Officer. What lessons have been learned about patient safety in relation to new build hospitals, specifically handover and maintenance of buildings? Cabinet Secretary. So there are some immediate lessons. Uh, there are some lessons in that HPS report, uh, which uh, was published last week. Uh, some of those have already been picked up uh, by NHS Lothian in terms of the new children's hospital uh, for Lothian. Uh, there are other lessons that our directors of estates uh, are working through with the uh, chief executive of NHS Scotland uh, in order to see, and with Health Protection Scotland and Health Facilities Scotland, to see what more can be drawn at this point uh, from the HPS report in particular, but also they will look at the HEI report. Uh, as well and see if there is anything further. And that's what I meant when I said that whilst the independent review is very important and its work will be uh, of, of significance, there are recommendations that we can take forward at this point. Uh, and I am happy once the HEI report is published to um, set those out specifically in terms of buildings uh, and let members see what we are acting uh, to do on those. Rona Mackay to be followed by Annie Wells. Thank you, Presiding Officer. The Scottish Patient Safety Programme has clearly contributed to a significant reduction in harm and mortality in our NHS. Can the Cabinet Secretary outline how this internationally re renowned programme can continue to provide public assurance about the quality and safety of care that uh, the public expect? Cabinet Secretary. So, uh, Healthcare Improvement Scotland is uh, the primary driver of the Scottish Patient Safety Programme. Uh, it provides a uh, uh, assurance in terms of uh, its inspections and reviews and reporting of those and those are published uh, and can be used and, and seen uh, by others. Um, some of the data that we produce in terms of uh, overall general infection rates is also another area of assurance in terms of the continuing decline of C. difficile, MRSA and so on uh, and uh, some of the other work that we will discuss with Health Improvement Scotland, for example, on terms of surgical site infections and other aspects of the Scottish Patient Safety Programme, uh, which members can see for their individual health boards, uh, but there may be some merit in pulling some of that together for the health service across Scotland. And again, I'm happy to have a look at whether that is something that is worth doing. Annie Wells to be followed by Ruth McGuire. As the Cabinet Secretary points out, frontline staff do have a critical role to play in patient safety. Despite this, Figures show that there was an 11.5% cut in maintenance and estate workers across Scotland in the two years since September 2018. In NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, the numbers have reduced by nearly 19% since 2009. What action will be taken to address this drastic reduction? Cabinet Secretary. So Ms Wells is correct um, in the level of uh, vacancies being carried in maintenance and indeed in some instances in domestic staff. Uh, I'm very alert to that. Uh, and have already uh, asked for explanations from boards uh, about exactly what they're doing. And in addition, you, you'll know that there is a, a an annual operating plan uh, that boards are required to produce, which shows how they are going to use the resource that they have. Uh, this year, it will be within an overall three-year financial planning cycle, but there'll be more detail in, in the first year. We've been really clear about how we sign off that annual operating plan. And in that, I will be looking to ensure that capacity, and by capacity, I mean staffing, is not being reduced in areas which are critical to infection prevention and control. And I include all of those areas in that. Um, so we, and those plans, once signed off, will be published. So the member will be able to see what action we are specifically taking in those areas. Ruth McGuire to be followed by Mary Fee. 
Presiding officer, I'm sure across the chamber we agree all staff are essential to ensuring patient safety. Can I ask the Cabinet Secretary to outline what impact a no-deal Brexit could have on NHS staffing levels and patient safety? Cabinet Secretary. Um, so the member will know that um, our current estimate is that in terms of uh, health and social care, uh, just under 6% of the current workforce uh, are non-UK uh, EU nationals and that we have a significant uh, number of non-UK uh, EU nationals uh, in that specifically in our health service. Um, that figure is greater in different parts of the country and in different uh, job uh, roles. Uh, and so in our planning, uh, in terms of our workforce needs in some of the areas Ms Wells uh, identified and in other areas, has to take account of the fact that uh, we may not be able to retain uh, all of that workforce in the current climate of uncertainty. Um, there are practical steps that we can take and we uh, hope to be able to set those out for the Chamber soon in order to make good on our words, uh, which are genuinely intended that you know, all of those staff are very valued by us and we want them to stay. But there is an additional element to this and that is how we attract into our health service uh, some of those uh, from uh, EU uh, countries that have traditionally come to work here and the member will be aware of the 80% reduction at UK level of the number of nurses from uh, the European Union and non-UK -E EU nationals not registering uh, compared this year compared to last year to come to work in the UK. So there are serious issues in terms of uh, Brexit um, and serious uncertainty and anxiety being experienced by those who work in our health and social care services. And we are trying to do what we can to reassure them that they continue to be welcomed and valued in our service. Mary Fee to be followed by David Torrance. Last week, the Cabinet Secretary responded to my colleague Neil Bibby's question on infection control at the RAH in Paisley, saying that she shared his concerns about gaps in the domestic cleaning rotas. In light of this and other tragic cases in NHS Greater Glasgow and Clyde, does the Cabinet Secretary have any plans to review and update the National Infection and Control Manual, which was launched in 2012? And if so, when? Cabinet Secretary. So that, that is, will be part of what the independent review considers. It will consider uh, our existing measures, including that mandatory manual. Um, but in addition, um, uh, I have asked uh, our National Clinical Director and his to review what we currently have to see whether there are other improvements that we can make uh, in the light of current knowledge to some of those uh, particular steps. Um, so I, I don't know the answer to that yet. Um, I am very mindful uh, of the point that you make about domestic staff that Mr Bibby made and Ms Wells has made again. Um, I don't think I need anything reviewed uh, before I can act to make it clear to boards that I don't think it's acceptable to carry those levels of vacancy and maintenance and domestic and um, housekeeping staff. I don't think that that is acceptable. They are central to infection prevention and control, as central as any other bit of the workforce. So we can act on that now, uh, whilst we look at whether or not our current procedures require any updating uh, and review uh, as a consequence of our recent experience. David Torrance to be followed by Anas Sarwar. Can the Cabinet Secretary confirm if there are measures in place to ensure that health boards promptly and effectively implement any recommendations made by independent reviews? Cabinet Secretary. So, where a review is undertaken by Healthcare Improvement Scotland, uh, they have a process in place for uh, going back and checking that their recommendations and associated actions uh, are completed and indeed they, they take a view on whether the actions the board is suggesting it should take are uh, adequate to meet the recommendations that his have made. Where a review is external and the recommendations are to the Scottish Government, then obviously members uh, have a means by which they can uh, check that we as a government uh, are uh, what our response is to those recommendations and how we are taking them forward. And in addition, of course, as I've said earlier, we have those regular meetings with board chief executives, with directors of estates, directors of HR, directors of finance, and me with the chairs of health boards to, in order to pursue 
uh, specific recommendations on a board by board basis or across the whole of the health service. And Anasawa. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome the comments of the Cabinet Secretary today, but there have been clinicians and patients who have expressed concerns about the Greater Glasgow and Clyde statement that was issued on Friday, in which they seem to imply that there was a limited scope to the Cabinet Secretary's independent review and also announced through the views of their own. Can the Cabinet Secretary please take this opportunity to confirm that the review that she has announced has a broad scope that includes the maintenance and upkeep of the hospital since it was opened? And can she also outline what the three reviews Greater Glasgow and Clyde are proposing to do, what they are, and that the guarantee that that will not undercut her independent reviews work? Cabinet Secretary. So I'm grateful for Ms. to Mr Sarwar for raising that. It's, it's disappointing that um, uh, the board don't appear to have understood what I've said, I think, exceptionally clearly. Uh, let me say it again. Uh, I absolutely can confirm that the scope of the independent review that I have commissioned is exactly as it is in the answer to uh, the question that was uh, laid and answered. And so it goes back to the design and takes us right through. Um, and therefore, it will be because it complies with the Britain report's uh, recommendations, it will be for the independent chairs to then take that scope, uh, which is my commissioning, uh, work that into a remit, decide for themselves where they will bring in expert advice, where they will seek evidence from, how they will seek that evidence, how long they think that will take them, what will be uh, the opportunity for interim recommendations based on their work plan, if you like, uh, and I would uh, be asking them to permit that all of that is made public, and I have no doubt that they would be happy uh, to ensure that that is the case, uh, and that uh, I would uh, take that responsibility. Uh, in terms of Greater Glasgow and Clyde's review, uh, reviews, uh, my understanding, although I will make a point of uh, double-checking this in order to confirm it to Mr. Sawar and to others if they're interested, is that one of their uh, immediate reviews is on their current estate at Queen Elizabeth University Hospital to look at whether there are additional uh, maintenance and infection prevention and control measures that they should be taking now. There is another review in terms of flow through the hospital uh, to ensure that they have infection prevention and control uh, steps in the right place, if you like, as, as people flow through that hospital. Uh, but as I said, I will make sure that we have the clear detail of that uh, and make sure that Mr. Sawar and others, um, I'll pass it to other opposition spokespersons, uh, to make sure that they are clear on that. That, in my view, absolutely does not undercut the independent review, but should feed into it. And the independent review can take a view on those reviews and their conclusions. Thank you. And on that note, that ends our statement. We're going to move on shortly to the next item of business on the Human Tissue Authorisation Bill. We'll just take a few moments for members of the Minister to change seats.